Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Information Through a New Lens, What Lies Beyond ECM. I'm Teresa Resick, Director of Market Intelligence Group here at AIM, and AIM is your host and producer of today's event. And with me are Neil Stidoff of Sword Group and Dave Jones of Nexio. Nexio is the underwriter of today's webinar, and we thank them for their support. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. Before we get started, just want to offer a few pointers for viewing today's webinar. By joining live, you can customize your own viewing experience, so feel free to open, close, or resize the different windows. Across the bottom of your screen is a list of all of the widgets that are available to you. And group chat is one of those widgets available to you. And just uh, click on that icon from that list in the bottom. And with group chat, you'll be able to text chat with each other and also with a few of us from here at AIM. Do ask questions of the speakers throughout our time today using the Q&A feature. And we will hold these questions until the end where we should have about five or 10 minutes to answer them. You can also use this feature to ask for technical assistance. You may download a PDF of the presentation at any time. Just look to the resources list that's to the right of the slide area. And there are also a few other documents and links in there to help you learn more about today's topic. Just click in there at any time and the resource will open in a new browser tab and you'll be able to save and read it after the webinar. At the end of the webinar, a brief survey will open in your browser, but it's also in that widget area below the slides. And I'd greatly appreciate it if you'd take a few moments to offer your feedback and to suggest other topics for us to cover. And we are recording things today, and it will be posted to AIM.org's resources webinars page in just a few days. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers that we have with us. Neil Stidoff has more than 30 years of IT and information management experience. Currently, he's a strategy, business development, and information management specialist at Sword Group. And Neil is a former member of AIM's Board of Directors and is an integral member in AIM's GDPR and oil and gas special interest groups. Previous to his time at Sword Group, he was the head of strategic development and also the head of information management at Lockheed Martin UK. We also have Dave Jones, and he is the director of product marketing at Nexio. And Dave is a skilled evangelist and communicator who thrives on taking complex subject matters and delivering them to audiences at all levels via a variety of innovative, diverse, and ultimately professional channels. So right now, I'm going to turn things over to Neil to begin our discussion today. Neil? Right. Well, thank you very much, Teresa, and hello, everyone, wherever you are in the world today. So um, appreciate that introduction there. We've got a little slide here which just emphasizes those points and gives a few contact details should any of you wish to follow up with me after this presentation. So I'm going to dive right in here. We're going to spend uh, perhaps the next 20 minutes or so going through some of my observations about how the market is shifting. So to start with, we're looking at really ECM. So is it rubbish? Has it gone away? You know, is it appropriate still? And I would say that all things evolve. But um, we have to look at what's appropriate for the future. Um, maybe we find in certain areas that aspects of ECM evolved perfectly well and they're highly appropriate. So I might take an analogy there of uh, the world has sharks in it and in the ocean sharks work pretty good and have for millions of years. But I would think that our ECM systems probably don't look like sharks. They've started to evolve with strange tentacles and now they maybe need to work on land and we've tried to fit them with wheels. So if this starts feeling like you, maybe you need to think of what comes next. You know, how do we move on from that? But for some people in tightly regulated markets, perhaps, with formal and clear processes, mainly involved in internal information management, things could be effective and working well. Your economics might look good and the technology still works. So this is not a, a natural cause and effect that you must move in the direction of content services. So we'll look at establishing what's appropriate and how you can uh, add agility to your systems. But let's bear in mind, you know, the old monolithic ECM could still be appropriate and valuable to your organization. So we won't lose sight of that as we go uh, in the pursuit of the shiny new things. So I'm taking a look on this slide really as to what's compelling us to move. So we've had a situation where there are forces maybe pushing us as things reach end of life, they become difficult to support. The costs maybe rise, the skills become scarce. We're maintaining too broad a front. 
and there can be some uh, inertias in there and vendors reluctance to help us move maybe they're not ready to move maybe they've got a good cash cow running there so some of these things will compel us at some point to move holding us back of course will be a degree of fear uncertainty and doubt from our leadership as well as technologists as well as the user community or customers so these things are all saying the biggest thing I hear of hey it ain't broke and that really seems to throttle back a lot of activity a lot of reasons we could otherwise have moved along so we need to take a look and say well yeah something's working but is it still appropriate is it good enough could we be doing better uh, let's just reevaluate that let's look at it fresh and let's look at the proofs so when people want to move into adopting new technologies they want to find people who have done it a bunch of times before and that's not always going to be the case in this world there might be new named vendors coming along who people are unfamiliar with so we have to find out through communities such as this how we can uh, reassure one another that it's safe to move into these directions and listen to the analysts too uh, and look at people who are making success from this so when we look at the pulling forces as well we see that those are increasing often in our businesses the need to modernize increased agility uh, we want to be smarter with our information and use analytics get more value from it get more insight and people are more demanding they look at things that they're doing domestically with their iPhones and other devices and saying hey this all should be a lot easier it shouldn't suck when I come into the office it should be better than that so all those pressure fronts are, are ca causing us to be pulled towards the future and we need to have responses for those we need to know how to interact with those communities and give them what they need where it's appropriate again not chasing all the shiny things but knowing where stuff can add value uh, and certainly there are some transformational technologies coming along such as uh, distributed ledger technology which will shift things even more radically so we'll take a look at that in a little while so uh, I've, I've had my uh, coloring set out and drawn some little pictures here and people from a software development world might remember the kind of imagery that's in here that we had what the users wanted so a, a tire on a piece of rope and we end up with some strangely architected system which appears to do the same thing but it all kind of got complicated and is it is it right is it maintainable is it really what's appropriate and then that's just got harder as we're starting to lose control really as many new situations need to be addressed our organizations acquire new assets or new corporations and move into new territories and maybe new systems spring up or get acquired to fit into that and it all gets kind of messy and rather than diminishing that just needs to increase as there's more interconnection going on between different organizations um, and things are shifting fast and computing is moving instead of pulling information to the center and processing it there staying more at the edge and being processed at the edge so I've got a couple of uh, little fun facts here that Gartner are assessing that by the year 2021 there will be one million new IOT devices sold per hour which I'll pause a moment which is quite breathtaking to think of the pace at which systems and information are going to be deployed and need to be coordinated securely and something done to leverage that information if we look at uh, where information is processed by 2022 Gartner are estimating that 75 percent will be created and processed outside of core systems so there's a big challenge coming as to how we're going to re react and respond to that so maybe our mutated sharks are really going to be not fit for purpose at all so I just click through on to what what are content services so we would say the content services are the technology and that intelligent information management is the philosophy that enshrines that so these are the uh, the different platforms apps components widgets etc that bring this to life so they can certainly add value to legacy systems and what we're not thinking of here so much is one overarching architecture or vendor even but these are multi-vendor multiple systems things that are just more agile connected natively and uh, pulled together with microservices adding value where they need to so it's a much more diverse environment harder to understand perhaps um, and certainly needs a, a different approach to managing that but onto that we can uh, derive clever stuff sentiment analysis looking at unstructured content and working out what it's telling us natural language processing moving away from written information to sort of verbal and image-based information auto classification 
and all the joys of AI and machine learning. So when we take a look at how the landscape shifting, we, we have people such as Gartner trying to give us a bit of a lift here in saying who are some of the people that are playing in this and how are they moving. So uh, it, it's interesting to look at these, but I would certainly advocate that it's not about any particular vendor that first and foremost is understanding the information you have and how it's uh, being handled and moved and that you might need to pick from multiple camps. In fact, most people are likely to have systems from many of these different vendors over a period of time. So what matters is that you get stuff to play nice together. So interconnectors, bi-directional ones become increasingly important. So we're saying, well, OK, organizing information, we've been doing it a long time. We should be good at this stuff, but it's difficult. Um, things have moved outside of our control, so most corporations can't even work out really where all their information is. As we look at enterprise file sync and share, people using their domestic systems, iPads, etc., and systems at home. So it's all got a lot fuzzier, and it's moving faster, and the content types have diversified. And I would say that there's really fewer people classed as administrative or librarians or the old document control type of structures. So there are less regulators and more control put into the hands of individuals who aren't so well trained in what to do with it. And up to date, really, people have uh, not found it easy to classify stuff and work out where to put it. And it's super easy to put it in all sorts of places, which makes sense to you, but perhaps nobody else. And we see that. Um, I see it a lot in engineering, in oil and gas, for instance, as all types of valuable content ends up in very strange places and it matters you know when you're doing complicated engineering activities it can result in cost overruns and failed engineering projects so we've got to get a grip of that and against that we're having to deal with tighter regulations so we're kind of a month into GDPR and we're starting to see some vendors um, really pulling out of certain markets for the time being so some of the press in the US have just decided to block out um, EU participants for now until they work out how to better deal with that. So I look now at some of the organizational forces and strategy going on, that there are good things happening, uh, but we're having fewer intermediaries going along. The rate of change is going up. There's more technical uh, aspects to play with. Expectations are rising. The IoT aspect and edge is increasing. So all these things coming to bear upon us, so the strategies that we might adopt coming out of that are what I could term business as usual. So we just keep on riding this organizational train as well as we can. We may say there's a strategy of uh, exiting this business or selling it up and moving on, or we try and evolve our business, or perhaps even spin up a new evolutionary organization, as we see some financial services doing with new little uh, bank-sponsored fintechs coming along to work out how the future could be. So amongst all this, I would say that the rise of the CIO and information professional is key because it's difficult to make sense of all this and the technologies and options are just increasing all the time. So folks need help and I think that communities like this could really assist with that. So how's it going? Um, if we look at AIM, AIM does a lot of research and pretty recently we've had the State of Intelligent Information Management published, which I've put a link into here and paraphrased. So we're saying, yep, businesses do see risk and opportunity, but they aren't responding real well at the moment. So there are a lot of plans out there, but they're pretty sketchy, haven't been put into practice particularly. There are lots more systems here than there were, say, 10 years ago even, and content is increasingly outside of those core systems because they may be seen as fit for purpose or people forget where stuff should go. And even the basics of content capture and scanning and such is, is not as good as it should be. So um, we have our little light moment here. Where are we? So the Dakota Indians have a saying there, when you're riding a dead horse, the best strategy is to dismount. And a lot of people don't. They, they just say, hey, we can't afford to do that. We're so deep into this. It's too difficult to change. But pressures and circumstance will compel at some point that change to happen. So uh, at the moment saying really recognize your situation, be real. And I've seen companies who've in certain cases invested tens or more of uh, millions of dollars and then said, you know what, we're going to pull the plug on this. 
this failed project or this old legacy thing, we're going to move in a different direction. It takes guts to do that. And I think that uh, one of the reality checks of content services is it can maybe reduce some of that shock. It can allow for more agile, more tactical transformation. So uh, less having to sort of swallow the whole elephant. It's uh, much easier maybe to derive some value to prove things to get the confidence of the board and the executives funding this to show that this stuff works. But uh, you sometimes have to be willing to abandon what might be seen as bad investments. OK, so looking at some recent experiences of uh, my organization, we've seen people wanting to do clever stuff, for instance, how to uh, visually handle engineering drawings. So the old way used to be that people like document controllers would identify key information on there, make sure that metadata exists, and then relate it to other systems. But it was labor intensive, it was slow, and a lot of the content was really old scans, so had to be handled in that kind of way. We're seeing now that many more kind of plugins that would use AI and fuzzy logic to work out, hey, here, here are some uh, tag numbers for this piece of equipment, and they're sufficiently visually similar, and we can relate them to other tags in other systems. So we can start to glue systems together with a visual front end, and that system is recognizing components on those drawings to see that, oh, here's a pump, here's a valve, and being able to know what that is and people can then click on it and drill through for further information. So we can see that applied in many other disciplines where old document types can be given new life and new smarts by being automatically interpreted without lots of human intervention. So what's that doing? It's reducing cost a lot, and it's becoming much more intuitive with far less need for training, people like engineers. And a lot of it can sit on top of the old content silos. So it's just adding new capability pretty quickly and at good cost. And we see uh, in areas like healthcare we've done recently some transformation of old systems, pulling out from old ECM, EDMS systems, into more, uh, in, in this case, Office 365 environment, being able to just grab that content, classify it, and move it super quick. So um, hundreds of thousands of patient records moved. And the big um, delay on that really is just turning the systems on that do it in the first place. Once they're on, you can push through vast quantities of data really quick. And again, pulling that human intervention aspect out of it and dealing with old database types that are problematic. And one aspect we're seeing increasingly is people with multiple different ECMs wanting something that will live across them. So people can first off view content but the concept of in-place records management so that they can interact, they can check out, modify, and return all of those through one common interface regardless of the different ECM backend systems. So that's a good simplifying value-adding layer that people are getting attracted to. So I'm not going to dwell on this next slide. It's just to say really what everyone is trying to do is be more productive, get the overheads down, uh, support the way people work, make them happier and enjoy what they do, look at the risk factors and regulatory pressures and move those down, and put in a, an easier platform and basis for innovation. So regardless of what organization or part of the world you're in, I think all of those things hold true. And these are factors that you can maybe look on um, as, as you dwell back on this presentation afterwards and see how those relate to your own organization. So I'll flip through to here what I would call people-centric modernization. So we'll look in a moment on technology-centric. But for here, we've, um, in SWORD, put a lot of effort around understanding personas or the nature of individuals in organizations. So who are these individuals? What's their normal mode of work? You know, In federal government, perhaps you've got people working out in the field, highly mobile, maybe exposed to stressful situations, using certain types of device, maybe with poor communications versus um, your information battle workers back at base who have a completely different class of system, always on connections and so forth. So we need to look at what use people need to make out of their systems and think very much of the world from their own perspective. So how they choose to work, how it can be made more flexible, easier, cheaper, faster. And as we look at things like um, AI and think, is that going to displace all these people? There's a thing which uh, is described as the Luddite fallacy. 
so we've seen um, in some cases that people thought with um, woolen mills turning up and cotton mills that this would actually reduce employment in those areas. Strangely, it actually went up as people realized the price of cotton went down through new manufacturing. People bought way more, so they needed more mills. So the net effect was uh, rise in employment. So we can't always predict that uh, technology change is going to be bad and it's going to be bad for people, that just things might operate slightly differently. In my uh, technology-centric view, we're seeing here that you need to be able to grapple with information from multiple sources, which can include sensors and devices and various different apps out there. We need to apply some rules. We need to gather it, um, coordinate it, control it. And then on that, we can do some smart stuff with um, analytics and machine learning and so forth. And from that, we derive some intelligence so it can support better decision making. We can visualize things more clearly, so we get clarity about what we should do. And the move of content services is to make all of that somewhat easier by just helping the information flow appropriately. So all of this really is to serve information up to people better and to um, also help with automated systems. So um, often in my space, that's the production of oil and gas resources and how we can interact with process control systems, for example. Okay, so I've just put um, some things I mentioned earlier on. All the buzzwords, I think, are uh, present and correct in this. <coughs> and people say to me, oh, well, things like blockchain, is that really real? Is it even allowable? Is it GDPR compliant? So I would pull out some points from those really adopting this in anger, like the United Arab Emirates, so they're saving an estimated $3 billion a year on document circulation through using distributed ledgers, millions of work hours, document volumes by 390 million per annum, and some 1.5 billion kilometers of driving time per year. So this is about having to allow people to access information at a single point that is trusted and not having to duplicate it, print it, move it in some of the traditional ways. So there are a lot of changes coming a lot of things which are making the world seem pretty different. And we're seeing the methods of payment, all these other technologies are allowing us to do very different things. But what I would say is watch out for the POC frenzy. So should you go off starting up proofs of concept on things like blockchain and adding that to your tech? Well, maybe, but you need to really think, is that appropriate? You know, is that just, um, is that something we're competent to do? Maybe we should be looking at partners who can do that. Maybe local universities can help us with that. Maybe we ought to coordinate with some of our peers, um, find people in communities where there could be a, a joint initiative in certain areas. Let's de-risk it. Let's make it more purposeful. So yes, avoid chasing those shiny technical things and only get into it if you are going to see it through to some meaningful end. And it doesn't end up just petering out and sucking up resource and um, adding to the concerns of management that things aren't really uh, turning into value for them. So there's some further information here. I've name checked deep analysis and for those involved with AIM seeing the new courses on emerging technologies, Alan was one of the course leaders on that in preparing that material. So there's another avenue people can adopt there if they want to see about those specific things. So all of that means really a degree of mapping. So I think, where are you? Where do you need to go? And look into these technologies and see where that's all leading. So I'm going to put in here just some of my personal recommendations to say all of this is not an IT issue. This content service is not technology. It's about opportunity, really, and business opportunity, whether you're in public services or in commercial uh, sectors. So the strategy means really making sure you reassess your information get to understand its value. So we're not just custodians in information management. We ought to understand how this information is used, how it could be used better, and what realizing that value would mean economically um, to our business. So we want to set a vision there for how the business could operate in the future. So this is where CIOs will play a crucial role in understanding that transformation and making sure there's the very highest level of buy-in to support that. And when we look at tactics and technology, we want to see about applying intelligent information management methods. So deploy some of these things, get some quick wins, and build out your wider technology transformation over time.
So that's a good deal of talking from me, and I'd like to hand right over to the uh, estimable Dave Jones, and he'll just run you through uh, the Nuxio interpretation of content services. Neil, thank you very much. Um, I think that, that was a fantastic walk through, uh, you know, the drivers for content services and the ways that people can potentially use this technology. And I really like the, the focus on in, in the intelligent use of IT and content services to, to start delivering business benefit. And um, as Teresa said at, at the head of the show, um, my name is Dave Jones. I'm Director of Product Marketing at Nuxio. And Nuxio are a content services platform provider. And as a result of that, you know, we've, we've been leading this charge towards content services uh, probably for about two, three years now. But what, what we decided to do at the start of this year um, was take a bit of a reality check. So we, we worked with AIM, we did some research and went out to the end user community and said, look, ignore all of the tech. Um, tell us about what you're trying to do with information, how you're trying to manage it, and some of the challenges that you're having in terms of doing that. And really, that's what I want to share with you today is, is some of the findings that we, that we gleaned from that research, um, and also really some of the interpretations and the non-technical aspects of, of what people are looking to do with their information and how they're looking to get leverage from it. So I'm going to run through that very, very quickly. But before we do that, I wanted to just highlight something. Um, so this, what you're seeing on the screen at the moment is the definition of, of enterprise content management or ECM. Uh, I think from about 10 or 12 years ago, um, written by AIM. And it talks about ECM as being the strategies, methods, and tools used to capture manage, store, preserve, and deliver content and documents related to organizational processes. And this is something that you know, vendors have taken, that end users have taken, and used as the, the, you know, the, the definition of ECM. Now, I want to offer up a potential definition for content services. Um, and what I want to highlight is, is just a few things. So for me, we're still talking about the strategies, the methods, and the tools used to capture, manage, store, preserve, analyze, and deliver data and content related to an organization. So a couple of things that I just want to highlight there. And the first thing is you'll notice that the, the definitions really aren't that different. And that's one of the key things that I want to get across. Content services is not massively different to ECM. There are a few subtle changes, but those subtle changes are hugely important. And we'll see that as we roll through um, the, the next few slides. So just a couple of things to, to highlight. Yes, we've added analyze into the things that we're doing, and, and that's increasingly important. You know, we need to be able to interrogate and interpret and make use of the information, the behavior, and, and the analytics. So that's key. Second piece is we're talking about data and content now not content and documents. So things have moved on. We're not just looking at parts of the business that are focused on documents. We're working with metadata. We're working with data from CRM systems or financial systems and pulling all of this together. And the last piece is that we're now talking about doing this across an organization not just looking at it related to organizational processes. And if you think back to what ECM was really good at, it was really good at doing things um, and optimizing processes that were document-centric. So things like accounts payable processing and automation. Those processes within the business all revolved around documents. The challenge with that was that there's an awful lot of things that you do within a business that don't revolve around either processes or, or explicit processes or around documents. So what content services is doing is widening the, the breadth, if you like, of, of applicability within the business uh, with the tool set that we're talking about. So I just wanted to highlight that up front. Um, but in the words of uh, many of the people that we talked to, who really cares about this? You know, who cares what we call this? Who cares what the definition is? Um, as an end user, what you're interested in is what you want to get from something and how you manage that information and data and process and all of these pieces within your business. So this is the, the start of the feedback that we got. So one of the biggest challenges for, for people within organizations at the moment is finding the right information in a timely manner. 
And what we found was that 76% of organizations or well over, well, over three quarters of organizations cannot find the right information in a timely manner. That's scary. And if you think about it, all of the digital transformation that we're talking about, all of the process optimization, it means very, very little if you can't actually find the right information to plug into those processes and to start those processes and transformations. So this is, this is really quite a scary fact. Moving that forward, um, Neil mentioned earlier, you know, the fact that organizations tend to have more than one system. And, you know, there are several statistics out there um, that back this up. I think um, anecdotally, one of the analyst firms told me the other day that the average number of information management systems that a large enterprise has is 32, which is, again, quite scary. Um, but the key thing here is that almost four out of five organizations um, have an inability to connect information between these systems or from these different systems together. And, you know, I'm sure many of you have done copy and paste exercises, to, and that's the only way that you can get stuff from one system to, to the next or rekeying or whatever. And honestly, the whole robotic process automation industry has been built because of this challenge. And it's key. And these are the things that, that organizations are struggling with day in, day out. Following up on that, getting access to information that's locked in those legacy systems that Neil was talking about is vital for three quarters of, of organizations. And notice one key word here, locked. Locked in legacy systems. Now, these systems are important to the running of the business because if they weren't, you would have got rid of them. But having information locked in systems is doing no good to the, the overall competitiveness or, or ability to function of the business. So th this, again, is a key challenge. And finally here, this was quite interesting to me, that the kinds of information management capabilities that an organization needs vary wildly dependent upon the process that they're considering. So this, this is basically organizations saying, hang on, you know, one tool does not fit all circumstances. You know, there's a very much a horses for courses mentality that we need to take. And that's something that ECM didn't do very well. So these are a number of different challenges. And, and really what I want to do is take this and, and take it into a non-technical context. So let, for example, let's say you want to buy a car. Way back in the old days of ECM, in, in ECM 0.1 if you want to call it that, um, this was the sort of way that you would buy a car. So there were a load of tools and technologies that, that the ECM vendor would come along with and say, you know, we can build anything. You know, we can build you this car. The challenge there was that it took a, a bit of a leap of faith from the end user organizations to go, okay, I can visualize what this can do for me, and I'm happy for you to build me that car. That was ECM 0.1, as I say. ECM version 1 took things a little bit further and said, actually, look, guys, you know, this is what we can sell you. This is our ECM solution, which is exactly what you want to do, all of your driving needs, which is great. And that was a huge step forward. But is that actually really what the organization wanted? Let's, let's take this a little bit further. So the little blue car here um, is what the ECM guys were selling, is what the vendors have been selling for the last 10 or 15 years. It's a car, right? It's an ECM solution. It's exactly what you want. Well, the reality is that different departments within a business, different businesses, different users have got different user requirements. So while that um, you know, CUV or you know, that, that little hatchback on the left-hand side may be perfect for the accounts payable department, the management wants a supercar. You know, the, the ingestion part of the business where they, they scan the documents in wants a big truck because they have to get a load of stuff through. So my point here is that that one-size-fits-all approach really doesn't work when you, when you try and deploy it properly to organizations. And this is, for me, one of the key, key reasons why ECM has never, never really delivered on its promise, because you have to be a little bit cleverer with how you actually deploy this sort of stuff. And for me, I just want to highlight a few differences between ECM and content services. Again, very subtle differences, but very important when it comes to how you actually use this. So firstly, 
I think Neil mentioned this earlier, ECM was single repository. Now, what I mean by that is that all of the information needed to go into one place, into that one ECM system. Um, now, patently, that hasn't worked because we've all got four or five or 32 different information systems within our business. And think about it, that, that was a lovely idea, you know, this one system to rule them all. Um, but it just doesn't work. Life isn't like that. The second point that I want to raise is that ECM was designed to solely serve information management professionals from my perspective. So it was designed to be that hatchback. Um, and that's great. If you were an information management professional, that's brilliant. You had exactly the tool that you wanted to do your job. But as I mentioned earlier, you know, what about management? What about people in you know, the HR department? What about people that don't have an information background, information management background or mentality? We still need to address the needs of those users because they all work with information. They just don't want to do it in that hatchback. And finally, again, Neil, Neil definitely mentioned this. Um, ECM was typically a single vendor solution. Again, it's back to that you know one system to rule them all approach. And the funny thing was, if you had two systems, two or three different vendors in there, vendors didn't play very well with other vendors. You know that they didn't didn't play with the other boys in the playground. If you want to look at it like that, which meant that you got these isolated silos that didn't talk to each other, that all did very specific things, and it turned into a complete and utter chaotic situation. Content services, on the other hand, or ECM 2.0, as some people are calling it at the moment, um, is subtly different. So it's multi-repository to start with, and that's a key change. What that means is that basically it doesn't matter where your information and content is actually physically stored, which system it's stored in. The content services platform acts as um, the conductor, if you like, the conduit, the the holder of all of the information so that they know what data and content is where. They know how to access it from the different systems, but they don't actually need to physically pick it up and move it into their system. It's like a puppet master that, that can get access and, and make all of these things happen without actually being directly connected to them. And that's very, very important. It's also designed for use anywhere within the organization by anyone on any device. Again, very different. Um, and what I'm not saying that a content services platform comes with a, a million different interfaces, but there are tools, um, there are low code development, rapid application development tools that come with good content services platforms that allow you very quickly and without a huge amount of code to, to develop a solution for a, a single department or even a single user in instances that are mobile ready to go. And that means that you can start delivering the benefits of properly managing information to anybody within the business. And again, Neil mentioned something earlier um, that, that content services really is about this ecosystem. It's not about requiring one tool, one ECM system to do everything. It's about figuring out um, which best of breed components you want in your system. So it could be that you use Amazon or Google um, for artificial intelligence and for classification of documents. It could be that you use DocuSign as your digital signature um, component that you plug in to this um, completely customized content services environment that works for you and your organization. Again, very subtle changes, but very, very important when it comes to using it. And just to sum this up, um, because I want to get into the Q&A session because I think we've, we've got some really good questions coming through. Content services for me isn't a revolution, not a, you know, a leap of faith or anything like that. It's just an evolutionary series of steps from, from ECM, from what used to be the norm. And as I've, I've said several times through the presentation, these are very small, very subtle, but very important changes. And to to, to offer my advice if you're looking to, to manage your information in a better way. Uh, three simple things that you need to look for in a platform to allow you to do this. Um, one is obviously it needs to deliver what you need today. That might sound a little bit trite, but it absolutely does. And it needs to deliver that in a way that 
means that the system molds itself around your business as opposed to your business having to change to mold around a particular system. That's key. Um, but it also needs to be flexible enough to manage what you might need tomorrow. It needs to be future-proof. And this ability this to, to create a connected ecosystem means that if you're using Amazon for your AI today, and tomorrow Google comes out with one that's infinitely better and infinitely cheaper, then you've got the ability to plug that new one in and take the old one out very, very simply. It gives you that future-proofing capability. And secondly, you also, or sorry, thirdly, you need to, to manage what you've got within the systems that were installed yesterday. So those legacy systems, you can't ignore them. A content services platform needs to be able to integrate to those so that you can get value out of them. Today, you can get access to them so that you don't lose and, and you know, have that information completely locked up. So at that point, um, thank you very much for listening. I'm going to hand back over to Teresa, who's going to run us through the Q&A session. Thank you. And we've been listening here to Dave Jones of Nexio. And before that, we were listening to Neil Stidoff of Sword Group. Um, just one thing I want to point out on Dave's contact slide, there's a link there to download the ebook. And this is the ebook that he's specifically talking from ECM to Content Services. There is a link in the resources section for you to download the ebook, as well as that uh, paper that Neil had mentioned on Ames Research on the latest Industry Watch findings on intelligent information management. And so both of those links are there for you to access right now. Um, but also, if you download a copy of uh, the PDF of the slides, you, you'll have the links in here to still access that information. So I um, uh, highly encourage you to uh, take advantage of that. As Dave said, we do have a number of questions who have come in, and I'm going to do my best to, to squeeze a few of these in, in in the time that we have available to us. And um, I, I'm going to start with um, Neil, but Dave, please do feel free to join in with this, because uh, I, I know um, at the beginning, Early, earlier in Dave's portion of the talk, he, when he was first defining content services, he was talking about the emphasis on the analysis but delivering data related to the organization, and less so about the documents side of things of, of, of how ECM had looked, looked at the industry in general. Um, but there's still a lot of organizations very concerned with document management and capture. How, how do you see that still fitting in with all of this? Neil, um, well, uh, yeah, sure. mute here. Yep. Um, so I would start by saying, if you have those ECM silos, you can still use their document management capabilities and any integrated capture systems that might fit within that. But uh, content services could add document management capability across many silos, and you could add smarter capture systems or modern ones that uh, don't require quite the same integration that those uh, various other ones have. So you really might try and simplify your capture platforms rather than have maybe five or more different ones, but to start to use a content services approach to have one newer, smarter one that can still hook back into that um, those old systems. Yeah, and I think just, just to add to that, Teresa, certainly um, uh, what I'm not advocating is that the content services platforms can't do um, document management and document centric processing they absolutely can this, this is the the sort of the evolutionary part of the puzzle is that everything that ecm could do is still there um, you just have the opportunity to do it in a, num in a number of different ways. And one of the things that, that I really like about content services um, in relation to capture is this ecosystem mentality so you know Different capture engines, different tools and techniques that you can use um, have all got different pros and cons. Um, in the ECM systems of the past, you were really almost tied to whatever capture capability came with that ECM solution, whereas now with content services, you can pick and choose. So we have customers who use uh, what I will call the traditional capture engines um, for scan documents, but use a different capture tool for mobile capture. Uh, and also use a different capture tool to do um, sort of intelligent analysis using artificial intelligence to, to classify those documents. So I think that there's an awful lot of things that we can do to, to make better use of the way that we capture content. You just mentioned artificial intelligence, and, and that was something that didn't really come up in the talk. Um, you know, Dave, how, 
how are you seeing more of artificial intelligence, intelligence or things like robotic process automation um, factoring in or, or blending yeah. in content services? Absolutely. I mean, it's key. And it's one of those things that we didn't include in this presentation because there's almost enough content there for us to have, you know, a completely separate webinar on, on the, the topic of artificial intelligence. Um, for me, AI has got two uh, current use uses, if you like, within content services. The first one is what we're seeing um, around classification and using things like um, Google Vision or Amazon Comprehend. Uh, to, to go and, and classify both documents but also images and videos and audio and things that we've never been able really to, to deal with before. So that, that classification part of things is, is great. Robotic process automation for me isn't AI, if I'm being brutally honest. Um, it's just the sort of the, the advanced use and the bulk processing power that, that these cloud-based typically platforms give you. Um, the future use of AI within content services that's really exciting for me is more around predictive analytics and predictive AI where you know you could come in in the morning and, and the system already knows which documents you should be working on in the morning or which tasks you should prioritize, you know, which emails you should look at first because it's done some sentiment analysis on them and then actually you know, these are the ones that, that you need to focus on first. So for me, that's where AI will, will move, but um, we're absolutely seeing AI being used more and more today um, and obviously that will grow into the future yeah I, I could add that we we're using it or machine learning really an evolved form of AI for handling things like field well reports in the oil and gas space so capturing those recognizing them working out what they are where they should go what they relate to and then putting them into the appropriate content systems so that's something we're just doing for real right now which you would describe as a content service um, and many things related more on the data side where it comes to predictive information based on real-time data coming from sensors. So, yeah, those things are active and happening right now. Good examples. Thank you. Um, I want to squeeze one more question in here, and uh, one of you had mentioned the, um, the, the stat, that, and we've all seen different versions of the stat of the multiple, if not dozens, of um, uh, of systems that are within an organization. And what if an organization is just not willing to migrate away from an existing system? How can they take advantage of content services? Dave, if I can start that with you. Sure. I, I think this is one of the big differences, that those subtle changes that, that um, content services brings versus ECM. So if you think back to the way that ECM was was sold and, and promoted, you know, it was a replacement for those existing systems. You know, you could migrate away from those systems and, and into this one central ECM system. Again, that, that, that's scary. You know, the prospect of moving all of your eggs from one basket to another basket, uh, you know, in a controlled manner with fail safes and rollbacks and all of that stuff, it, it was a huge project and really, really scary. And for me, it's, it, that scariness is the reason why it didn't happen as many times as potentially it could have done. With the connected aspect of content services platforms, though, it means that actually you don't need to migrate from day one. You can connect these systems into this sort of central information hub, if you like, and get the value out of all of those systems without actually losing them. And at that point, you know, if you do decide that you want to sunset one of those applications because, you know, maybe it's not supported or, or it's costing you a lot of money, you can then intelligently migrate the content and the data out of that system in the background at your own pace. So it's not a big bang because the users are now going through this, this new information hub to get access to their content and processing. Um, so as far as they're concerned, they don't care where the data and the content is stored as long as they can get their jobs done. So you, content services that allows you to manage that in a much more intelligent and, and you know, risk-averse way. Thank you. Thank yep. you. I'm, I'm, I might add briefly to that, if I may, that, uh, yeah, just to understand the conditions un, under which you would have to move away from those systems and just monitor it. So in the meantime, by all means, sweat that asset, get the most you can from it, but no 
where you're going to go over a precipice. Uh, it might not be something of your choosing. It might be something in the external environment that causes that change. But just understand what levers are applying to it. Um, but within that, just, just crack on and um, make better use of the information in those systems. Good points. Thank you. Um, something else uh, Neil had mentioned, um, uh, the AIM training on emerging technologies, and I just wanted to point out here um, that AIM is offering a special discount for all of AIM of our online training courses. And it's now until the 30th, so it's just about to the end of this week to take advantage of this discounted price. Um, so if you go to aim.org slash training, and there is our, our new Emerging Technologies program, and as, oh, as well as a lot of other programs in there um, that's all part of this discount. We have one on you know, SharePoint and Office 365, one on Modern Records Management, BPM, Governance. There are so many different types of, of course programs in there. So, uh, like I mentioned, purchase any of these, multiples of these, um, by the end of this week, receive a 40% discount on that price. That code is SUMMER18, and that is at aim.org slash training. So uh, I highly encourage you to take advantage of this um, this week. And since we are at the end of our webinar time today, I um, just wanted to remind everybody that we have been recording this. Um, we'll be send, and it will be, that replay will be available in a day or two. Don't forget to download the resources. Please take the survey that we have. It's um, in the widgets uh, across the bottom of your screen. I greatly value your feedback. And I very much want to thank our underwriter, Nuxio. Without the support of our solution providers, AIM would not be able to bring you these free educational programs. So thank you, Nuxio, for your sponsorship. It is appreciated. So as we bring our webinar to a close, I just want to leave everyone with our speakers' closing thoughts or key takeaways from what all we've discussed today. And I'd like to begin first with Neil Stidoff, your closing thoughts. Uh, thank you, Teresa. And uh, yeah, my final thoughts were the world of information management used to be about looking after your stuff. The world of intelligent information management and content services is really turning that stuff into power and value. So it's a much more progressive attitude. But I would say do avoid your business going wild. So the business buying its own stuff, moving the information around can end up being inappropriate, insecure, or in some cases illegal. So I would caution that governance around information still matters. But apart from that, go have fun. Thank you, Neil. And Dave Jones from Nexio, your closing thoughts today. Yeah, I think just to echo what Neil said, um, but also f for me, this is a really exciting time. Um, never before has the technology and the use of technology, that intelligent use of technology, been able to solve as many real end user problems as it as it can do today. So, you know, the desire has been there from the end users for many years. The ability to to meet that desire from a technology point of view, I believe, is there now. So for me, the next couple of years are going to be really interesting. We're going to see some fantastic use cases of people doing things with information that, that we have never really thought about and seen before. I do agree with that, Dave. Well, everybody, thank you so much for your time today. From, um, from AIM, this is Teresa Resick, and we will see you on our next webinar.